So as many of you know, you're here for a school and community garden webinar, particularly around best practices during COVID-19. We'll be talking about um, suggestions right now from public health professionals, produce safety professionals, as far as how to uh, safely uh, manage school and community gardens and, and personal actions in these types of spaces, um, as well have, as have plenty of time for Q&A. Um, if you have uh, any bigger questions, please keep your Q&A to the end. We will have a nice chunk of time. We have the room if we need it until 4.30. Um, but for any clarifying questions or more immediate questions, you're welcome to use the chat box, which you can, um, if you mouse over your screen, you can find it at the bottom, um, or uh, unmute yourself. Sometimes that, that's faster and, and more immediate. If you have a particular timely question, please feel free to unmute yourself and then just mute yourself um, once you've uh, been heard. Uh, okay. For uh, today's agenda, we'll cover introductions, um, a little bit about the foundation, what is COVID-19? That might be review for a lot of you, but it's a great place for us to um, have a common understanding about the hows and whys of what we're going to talk about next, which is what we're all here for, uh, best practices in communal gardens during COVID-19. And then again, at the end, um, we'll have more time for a question and answer. Um, feel free to use that chat box or unmute yourself if you have any particular questions. Um, what I'm going to do real quick, and I think I have to stop sharing for just a second, is while I introduce uh, those presenters who are here with us, um, I'll also do a poll um, of those of you who have just joined us. Actually, <laughs> we actually have someone else joining us also from Renewing the Countryside, and they may have been able to take over those polling uh, skills. It looks like that other device might have that. So if you can hear me, and you're also here from Renewing the Countryside, feel free to enact that poll. Uh, as I am no longer able to. That's right down at the bottom of your screen. And if we um, can't get that poll going after all, um, it would be great to use the chat box, but uh, it looks like that might not work. So let's just use the chat box. Um, let us know, I know many of you as you were entering were sharing where you were coming from. Um, if you can share uh, what type of community garden or school garden you work with in your position in the chat box, that would be great. So again, is it a school garden? Is it a community garden? Um, any details about that in your position? Are you a parent? Are you a school administrator? Are you a teacher? Are you a volunteer? Feel free to share that in that chat box. All right. We even tested the poll at the beginning. Thank you for starting to share that in the chat box. Okay, so I will go back to sharing my screen. Um, and we will um, do our introductions while you are doing yours. Um, so I'm Grace, I'm with Renewing the Countryside. Uh, we're a nonprofit based in Minnesota, but with a reach across the upper Midwest. Um, and I work on our farm to school and farm to early care programs. We've hosted farm to school networking and educational events since the mid 2000s in over 30 communities, including several earlier this year when we were still allowed to gather. Um, and uh, the USDA farm to school grant has been supportive of that and our ongoing technical assistance following those. Um, we also have Natalie, if you want to wave. Um, Natalie Hoydal is an extension educator uh, for local foods and vegetable production. She works with growers across the state ranging from community gardens to large commercial farms on all aspects of production, so she'll be sharing some information with us. We also have Heidi All with us, if you want to wave. Um, 
She is the lead teacher, uh, environmental education coordinator and school coordinator at Discovery Woods, uh, a charter school in Brainerd. She is in her fourth year managing a garden space of roughly 50 raised beds uh, and with the help of students and a summer club. She currently sits on the Minnesota Schoolyard Garden Coalition stewardship team. Annalisa Haltberg, if you want to do a quick wave, thank you, is a statewide edu extension educator in food safety at the University of Minnesota, where she co-coordinates the on-farm GAPS education program and has worked since 2011 providing farm food safety education to fruit and vegetable farmers and gardeners around good agricultural practices, also known as GAPS, and the FISMA produce safety rule. We also have Kirsten Saylor. Kirsten, if you want to give a quick wave. Um, she has two hats. Uh, she works with St. Paul Public Schools uh, as a part-time school garden coordinator for Bruce Vento Elementary School, and also as a coordinator for a multi-department school garden program where she helped develop a school garden handbook, garden to cafeteria program, and continues to work aligning district policies for success and sustainability in this instructional space. She's also been working with us at Earning the Countryside to provide insight on school garden best practices during our farm to school events um, over the winter here. Uh, I wanted to also thank Jody Nordland for her assistance in participating in planning and to welcome Valerie Gamble and Sammy Burrington. If you want to give us a little wave. Um, Thank you. Sammy Burrington uh, is a registered dietitian for the Minnesota Department of Education. She's been with the department for eight years, working in different roles, including monitoring the school nutrition program, certifying compliance with school menus, and working on food distribution programs for schools, and most recently, firm to school efforts statewide, managing the fresh fruit and vegetable program for elementary schools, and Valerie Campbell. Uh, she's worked with the MBA for 11 years, most recently as a manager developing a new statewide program designed to regulate on-farm produce safety practices and implement the produce safety rule. She has previously worked as an inspector, supervisor, and outreach coordinator for MBA, and prior to that worked in California uh, doing farming and egg extension work. Um, so I know that's a lot. Uh, we're excited to have all of them and all of you with us. Thank you again for sharing your position and how it relates to school or community gardens in the chat. That's really helpful to know uh, and understand. Um, and now we'll kind of get rolling uh, with these fine folks sharing information specific to their backgrounds and insight. Uh, Sammy and Valerie are on to clarify anything from um, their agencies, and we'll definitely be uh, hopping in on the Q&A section. Um, and again, feel free to chat if you have questions, if it's a timely question specific, you know, to clarifying something, feel free to um, hop in and unmute. Or, uh, unmute. Uh, okay, so let's get into it. What is COVID-19? Let's get that foundation of the whys and hows of best practices in community gardens. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Again, I'm Annalisa Holtberg. I'm an extension educator at the University of Minnesota. And thank you to Renewing the Countryside for hosting this today and to all my co-panelists here. Um, hopefully this will be uh, informative and we'll have some really good discussion. So before we get started, we did just want to make a, a few disclaimers that this information is coming out regularly from our public health professionals. That's where we have pulled this information from, uh, for you today, but it is changing. This is a new disease and things might change. You'll have to continue to educate yourself. As you do that, we do hope you turn to trusted sources of information, public health organizations, extension, renewing the countryside, are nonprofits that, that gather this fact-based uh, information. So we're also not attorneys, we're also not epidemiologists, but we have gathered the salient information from those folks and kind of packaged it for you today. All right, next slide, please. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time 
um, just kind of going over what we know about the virus so far. Like Grace said, this might be repeat from you if you've been on other webinars or been reading this in other um, sources, but it is, I think, really important and really interesting to think about what the virus is, perhaps what it isn't, and that really helps us prioritize our actions and ground us in in science and fact-based information so that as we are spending our precious time, I know some of you might be volunteers and you might not have a lot of time to dedicate um, as you're dedicating time to reduce the transmission of COVID among your staff, among the children that work at your gardens. Um, these, this is what we know so that you can prioritize those actions. First of all, it's a respiratory illness. It's not a foodborne illness. That means that it's transmitted primarily in the air. The infection occurs in our eyes, our nose, and our mouth, and in our upper and lower respiratory tracts. A foodborne infection might be something like E. coli or salmonella or norovirus that has gastrointestinal symptoms primarily. COVID might also have some gastrointestinal symptoms, but they aren't the primary symptoms. The other thing is that this is a novel strain of coronaviruses. Coronaviruses are a wide, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of coronaviruses. This is a new strain. We don't have any known immunity vaccines or therapeutics for it so far. So we have to take it very seriously, which is why we're doing all of the things that we're doing. But I do want to be clear that as for the FDA, CDC, and others, there is no evidence that this has been transmitted via the food itself or the food packaging. So really, this is respiratory, not a foodborne. All right, next slide, please, Grace. It is in interesting to think about how the ages of the people that have had confirmed illnesses are distributed. I think sometimes we are hearing, oh, it's just the old people, or um, you know, this is certain, it's only those that have underlying conditions that are going to die from it. Certainly the mortality rates are likely greater in those populations, but really across the spectrum, people can get the illness. The youngest among us seem to be the less likely to contract the illness, but um, beyond that, it's pretty evenly distributed. So we all need to take precautions and we're all susceptible. Okay, next slide, please. So I alluded to this before, but just to be clear, it is primarily spread through those droplets. So the droplets are tiny microscopic little bits of saliva that are expelled when we breathe and cough and sneeze or perhaps even talk. And they leave our body. If we're infected, they can have the viral particles in them. They're spewed out. Picture like sneezing on your computer screen. See the spray on there? That's what that is. And these droplets can go as far as six feet or even farther, perhaps, but roughly six feet is where the most of those droplets fall. So the way that people get it, the way that it's, it's so is transferred so well in family units because we're so close together or in think of the meatpacking industry or think about other places that people are in close proximity to each other. That's because those droplets have entered our mucous membranes. It can also happen through surfaces when those droplets fall. It's a lot less likely to be transferred that way because if you think about it, the droplet is leaving the, your nose. It's drying out in the air. Remember, it's tiny, tiny, tiny. It's drying out in the air. It's landing on the surface where it then dries out more. Then someone else has to come by, swipe it with an object or their hand, and then they have to put that into their, onto their face. So there's many steps there, and those steps make that less likely. Now, we can't rule out surfaces, which is why we're cleaning and sanitizing those surfaces. But if you're, when you're prioritizing, think of those surfaces a lot, like more like five out of 100. <laughs> and 95% is keeping people away from each other. Now, don't quote me on those numbers. But roughly, I mean, when you're thinking about prioritizing, that's what it should be. And then the last one is just the aerosols. Those are the even tinier than the droplets. Those are primarily in a healthcare setting, like in, when intubation occurs. So they're a little unsure about uh, aerosols, but primarily those droplets. Okay, I think that's it for me. Thank you, Annalisa. This is just a quick yep. overview of um, what we'll be diving into. Given that knowledge, uh, some of the main things we wanna keep in mind, 
as far as best practices for gardeners in communal space all spaces. So we'll be diving into each of these, but we kind of wanted to give you a sense of what was coming. Um, and a lot of this is really familiar to you. It's what you've been hearing, like maintaining social distancing, frequent hand washing, um, and a, a number of uh, practices that you'll want to keep in mind in your gardens with these types of public health practices in mind. Uh, we'll dig into that now. But we did also just want to let you know that uh, in addition to what we'll be sharing today or really um, uh, informing what we're sharing today, there would be, these references will be available. We'll share them with you here in the chat and in our follow-up email um, that will be really handy for you um, to keep in mind. So MDA recently shared a fact sheet. Um, there's an example of it right there for you and a link right here. And our uh, wonderful extension partners, uh, Annalisa and Natalie also have this fantastic template response plan that you could find really handy. Um, so as we dive in, we'll be sharing a lot of information. Please just know that um, there are some great local and national tools out there. We'll continue to share with you um, that you can use as references. All right, so like Annalisa said that this virus is mostly transmitted with human human contact. And so one of the most important things you can do in the garden is to maintain physical distancing. Um, and that's really easy to say, but it's a lot harder to actually do. Um, and I think part of the reason we actually made this template is that we kind of saw people getting really caught up on specific rules. Like you can only have two people in the garden. But really, it depends on the size of your garden and depends on the shape of your garden. And so in order to really do uh, physical distancing, you kind of have to step back and take this risk perspective to really assess your space and how people move that space or move through that space. Um, so just a couple of ideas. These are not like the end all be all. These are just some ideas. Um, one idea is to stagger gardening times. So maybe have people sign up for shifts so that you can kind of control how many people are there at a time. Um, an example of going a little bit further with that idea is um, you can see this little image in the bottom of all the different colored boxes could be to actually kind of map out the plots in your garden and say, okay, only the orange people can come on Mondays, the blue people can come on Tuesdays. You don't have to do that. It's just an idea of how you can kind of stagger people to make sure that people are gonna be far enough apart when they're working in the garden together. Also just reminding people of what six feet looks like. Um, I have found, so we, we are not going out um, for the most part, but some of the extension folks who are doing research have been granted some exemptions. And so I've been planting potatoes and just realizing like how hard it is to actually stay six feet apart and to remember what that looks like, especially when you're outside. I think when you're inside, you have more like natural kind of indicators, like you have a table or a desk or something that can kind of give you a sense of what that looks like. Um, so one idea is just to put up signs. Uh, the Department of Ag has this really nice little infographic here on the left um, as part of their guidelines. Um, and I think Kirsten also had this really nice idea where you could go to your garden and try to identify things in the garden that are six feet. So maybe there's a six foot long picnic table, um, or maybe you don't have anything and you need to put flags in the ground. Just having physical reminders there for people to reference when they're out um, is helpful. And then just having reminders around because it's not very natural for us to stand that far apart. And so we kind of have to constantly be reminded, especially when we're outside um, and thinking about other things. In terms of keeping non-gardeners out, I know that can be really hard depending on your situation. Um, so if your garden's in a really, really public place, maybe you need to think about putting signs around just saying like, please gardeners only in this space. Uh, maybe put some sort of tape to have kind of a temporary, not a fence situation, but something that physically kind of excludes the garden. So it's gonna look different everywhere. Um, but thinking through how people move through the space is really like, there's no set of rules that applies to everything. You kind of have to stand back and assess your situation. And then of course, um, 
gardens are really social spaces. And unfortunately, uh, I think this summer, if you typically have like picnics every Friday or concerts and events in the garden, just kind of think through all of the things that maybe are not essential um, and how you can either limit or just not do those things for a while. Okay, I'll talk about hand washing briefly. So I said before, it's primarily respiratory. It can also be on, on surfaces. So hand washing is a great way to break that chain of transmission if it is on surfaces or if it is on your hands and you're shaking hands, which you probably shouldn't be right now, but in case you are touching other things. The other thing about hand washing is there are still all sorts of other illnesses that we can share amongst each other and there's still foodborne illnesses so hand washing uh, really is helpful with all of those so encouraging all gardeners to wash their hands well when they enter the garden and during gardening activities again there is no set specific rule you must have them wash their hands before xyz a good idea would definitely be it for it when they get there because that would reduce the chances that, that if they brought it in from outside it's a good starting point just wash well and that includes the kids everybody and then before harvest is always a really good idea it always has been we've been talking about good agricultural practices for many many years before COVID came along and hand washing has always been a really important way to keep our produce safe for our customers. So um, washing well before harvest. Sanitizers, a hand alcohol-based sanitizer is, it, sanitizer is effective to inactivate this virus. However, sanitizers aren't effective on hands if the hands are dirty. If you picture a hand sanitizer in a hospital setting, those hands of that doctor are very clean and they are used as an insurance there but in a in a garden setting in a farm setting when your hands are likely content you know visibly dirty that hand sanitizer will will basically not do anything so that's why it's really important to have an actual hand washing stand there okay next slide we have some ideas for hand washing stands. Stand. It's there and when you walk into the garden, it should be relatively easy to get to. I lose you. I think I'm back. I reshared the screen. Huh. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. No worries. Okay. There are, um, so make it easy, make it convenient and make it something that someone doesn't have to go out of their way to do because we, if it's a, if it's going to be a challenge, then they're less likely to do it. So have the hand washing stand include soap does not need to be antibacterial, just some sort of soap paper towels. So a single use towel, is is what is required it, those can be cloth if you launder each one of those cloth after each use generally it's going to be paper towels and a garbage to put the um, paper towel when you're done the water doesn't have to be warm it makes it a lot more pleasant to wash our hands in the spring and the summer but also that can be a challenge to keep it warm i know that at a lot of farmers markets they have the insulated hand the insulated insulated igloos that they've re retrofitted with a, a different kind of a a valve. So that valve is a, on the top there you see is a free flowing valve and at the one on the bottom, the water, you, you turn it, you turn the spigot, first take out a paper towel, tuck it somewhere so you have it, then open up that valve, then wash your hands for 20 seconds, take your paper towel, turn off the valve and throw that, that paper towel away. That would be the best way to do that. Okay, I think that's it for hand washing. All right, so another really simple principle is just to stay home when you're sick. Um, we do know that there are plenty of asymptomatic carriers of uh, COVID-19, but in an ideal situation, um, if you're having any symptoms that are associated with it, you should stay home and not come to the garden. Um, 
And so that's pretty straightforward, but a follow-up question that we get is like, how long do you have to stay home? How long do you have to stay away from people? And so these are guidelines um, for employment, basically. So like, how long do you have to wait before coming back to your workplace? But I think that they can very easily be um, taken up as garden-wide policies. So basically the CDC recommends that people should stay home until three things have been achieved. Um, you haven't had a fever for at least three full days, so 72 hours without like ibuprofen, Tylenol, those are medications that can reduce your temperature. And so you have to have three days pass without taking any fever reducing medication. You also have to have all of your symptoms improved. Um, you can't be coughing anymore. Um, and then seven days have to have passed before your symptoms first appeared. And so if you can check off all three of those boxes, the CDC is saying that at that point, the risk of you coming back into the garden um, is low enough that that's acceptable. Um, you as a garden can always have more restrictive policies than that. You could say you need to have 10 days that have passed um, since the first symptom appeared. Um, but those are the basic CDC recommendations. Oh, and also I'll just say um, the little poster here on the right the CDC has really, really nice graphics um, that are available in, I think, up to like 10 languages. So that's a really good free resource that you can have and just print them out and post them around the garden. All right. So Annalise is going to talk more about um, sanitizing surfaces. But before you get to that step, it's also a good idea to kind of step back and think about how you can reduce these high touch surfaces in the first place so that you're not sanitizing them like every two minutes. Um, and this is something that I think it's also good to have some perspective on. So as Annalisa explained, like the vast majority of transmission is gonna come from respiratory contact, from people being close together. Um, and I think we've seen, we've seen some gardens say like, we're gonna lock up all the tools, everyone has to bring their own tools. And, I think it's kind of a balance of like, maybe not everyone in your garden has their own tools. Um, and so it's kind of this balance of access and safety. Um, and so the one idea, say you're talking about garden tools, shovels could be to say, everyone who has their own tools, like bring them if you can, use your own tools. And if you don't, these tools are still available, but you need to make sure that you're sanitizing them. Um, think about things like gates. If there's a gate that every single person has to touch as they walk into the garden, maybe just think about leaving that gate open while people are there so that you don't have so many people touching the same surface. Um, if every single person uses the same watering can, maybe think about, there are a lot of things you could do. You could ask people to bring their own. You could assign one person to do the watering for everybody so that you don't have so many people touching those surfaces. Um, so again, just kind of stepping back, thinking about how people are moving through that space, how, how people are using the tools and the items in that space, and ideally reduce the contact to begin with, but also be, be reasonable about making sure that it's still a space that people can access um, and use. And then in those situations, Annalise is gonna talk now about how you can actually sanitize things to make sure that um, it's okay for multiple people to be touching them. We can go on to the next slide, Grace. Thanks. All right. So moving down kind of the priority list from so physical distancing, cleaning and sanitizing of surfaces is still important in case there are those people that came to the garden that were asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic and they did cough or sneeze on those, on those surfaces. Also for foodborne illnesses, it's really important to keep our tools clean as well. So the good thing here is that our, the kind of cleaning and sanitizing routines that we might have done before are probably adequate with the addition of some of those high touch or frequently touched surfaces, the gate handles, the hose nozzles, um, shared tools. I bet that you can sit down as a group with your team and think about the things that people touch quite a bit within the garden. Those should be sanitized at least daily when people are there. If you want to do it more frequently, that would be 
prudent, but don't think that you need to, you know, every half hour start sanitizing every surface in the garden because I don't think that that would be sustainable. Um, so focus on those high touch surfaces, but also the food contact surfaces, the tables that you might be sorting things on, your buckets and totes, those should be, if they're visibly dirty, they should be washed first, scrubbed with some detergent and water, sprayed down, and then spritz with your sanitizer. If they're not visibly dirty, like a gate handle, I wouldn't say that you need to necessarily scrub it with soap and water first because it's probably clean. Occasionally, it wouldn't be a bad idea to wash it down, but spraying it with sanitizer uh, during the day while people are there is probably sufficient. Okay, next slide. There are not any any disinfectants that are specifically labeled for approved use against this virus yet. It's a brand new virus. But the good thing is it's not actually that difficult to inactivate this virus, given what we know about it. Um, it's a lot less sturdy in the environment than other things like norovirus that can last for a week or more on a surface. This one is kind of a weakling in terms of viruses, thankfully. So household bleach is very effective at inactivating it. Um, if you are okay with using bleach, about a tablespoon to a tablespoon and a half in a gallon of water, mix that solution up and pour it into a sanitize into a bottle, label it well, and store it somewhere safely away from children. And that would be a very effective sanitizing solution that you can use after cleaning those food contact surfaces or on those high touch surfaces. This is not a situation where more is merrier. Don't say, you know what? I know she said a tablespoon and a half. I'm gonna go ahead and put a cup in there. It's that's dangerous. There's been a number of calls to poison control because people are kind of going crazy with this. It's specifically designed to do what it's supposed to do at these rates. So you should use the rates that are um, given to you and they're in it and be, be assured that it is effective at those lower rates, okay? Uh, next slide. Okay, that's it for me. It's my turn. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kirsten Saylor. Uh, we just want to talk a little bit about planting for success. And so really, I want you to think about what you might want to plant in your garden. We're talking, again, we're talking about a communal garden. For a community garden where it's an allotment garden and everybody has their own plot, then they have to make the decision about what will work for them. Um, knowing that we don't know if somebody's going to get sick or not, or uh, what access to water looks like. So the, all those things could change. For a school garden, uh, there might be other considerations in place, like what is it that you need to have for fall? And right now, uh, I would say it's still about 50-50 whether we're going to be back in the building or not. Um, I don't think anybody really knows. And so I would say just it's better to plant it than not plant it. Just what will you plant it with? So building flexibility. Low maintenance plants are what I'm gonna recommend and that would probably be anywhere between cover crops, annual pollinators for school gardens. Uh, otherwise, something that doesn't need a lot of love, that can handle the heat, that can handle a little bit of drought if you're not able to get out there and water. Um, something that might not need a lot of tools. and really I think once you get it in the garden you're going to be fairly good. So we at St. Paul uh, plant and raise beds so they will need more water than something would need if it was in the ground. The water is just going to drain from those beds a little bit more. Uh, so for that reason I would say definitely I would think about putting in transplants first. They can probably handle a little bit more. You can do spot watering with transplants. So something that doesn't need a lot of seeds. Uh, carrots, for instance, they are very sensitive to being dry, dried out and they have to be planted at the top. So just think about what really needs a lot of love and care and what you just don't go for those. Don't go for the divas. Now, you might want to balance out food and flowers in this case, and so then something like tomatoes could work quite well because they can handle drought. Um, and again, temperature swings. 
I love kale. I find that it's really hearty. It can take almost anything. But again, you also might want something that can provide a lot of cover to keep out weeds. And so something like green beans might be the way to go. Green beans and peas and oats are um, all considered cover crops and they can also provide like learning opportunities in the fall, even if they've gone to seed completely. So think about maybe it's not food, but maybe you're still teaching a life cycle lesson. Um, or think about planting in different heights. So something that's providing almost like a ground cover effect and something that's higher up. I love broccoli when it goes to seed. It's just fun for the kids to try and figure out what the heck it is once it's done there. All right. Also think about, I did mention seeding and transplanting. Think about mulch. Mulching is the most beautiful thing that one can do for their garden plot. Um, and in plot composting, if you don't have mulch, think about how you can do that in a way that you're not spreading seeds. Make sure that the roots that when you pull out a plant, make sure that the roots are exposed to the air and the sun and drying out and not going to go and reroot themselves. All right. Thanks. As a school garden, as a community garden, uh, Natalie said it very well, we are learning new skills, we're learning new behaviors, we are checking the assumptions that we've had. We need to make a plan as a group and then we need to support that plan. So constantly having conversations is a good way to go. Um, providing some kind of training if that's necessary, if that's what it works. If it's a small group that's decided to come around a space like a school garden, then maybe the making a plan would be the thing that works and having something on site. And so at St. Paul, we developed a sign that's very much like the one that you see here. This one, um, this one can be made available. I don't think I have it linked up yet. But this one is from Frogtown Greens. And it actually comes right out of the conversation that we had with Natalie and Annalisa. So that's great. Um, really for your plan, you're looking at risk. So where are those high touch places? What's our capacity? Can we actually water? What will we need for that? So if you cannot provide a wash station and you cannot uh, have reliable access to the water, I would really, really think about doing something like cover crops, something that won't make you have to go and wash your hands or be out there very frequently. Uh, other resources that might be available and how do people talk and communicate with each other? So for instance, not everybody, like in a community garden setting, you have a lot of, in my experience, you have quite a few people that are older that might have differing levels of uh, familiarity around uh, technology. So it might be back to phone trees. And that's great. That's another way to kind of keep in, keep in touch with each other. Um, but make sure that everybody's been connected with, and especially in your community garden. And for your school garden, well, we'll get to that next. Next slide, please. So for a school garden, you are, this is slightly, how do I want to say this? For community gardens, you can take a look at this and see if this might apply for you. If you have a landowner that's, um, that will be looking at risk and liability. Um, so take that to heart. But for school gardens, I can tell you right now, you should, number one, already be connecting with your school garden team. If that's the other, back, if it's other staff, if it's families, try and reach out to them now and kind of see where people are at. So you're just going to do a touch point. How do people feel comfortable with it? Are they feeling overwhelmed? Um, and remember, it's easy to say yes, it's harder to get out to the garden. So even when people say, oh yeah, I'm in on it, make sure that you almost cut that commitment in half in your head and say, yeah, but life happens. So we're just gonna take that realistically. Secondly, as a group, once you've kind of gotten a sense of who's still on board with everything that's happening, make sure you connect with your facilities, your grounds department to see if they've developed any kind of protocols or processes that they want you to take. Um, at St. Paul, Par Paul Public Schools, we have, uh, we, I've had to share with them what were the considerations to think about, put together a plan for all school gardens on how they can operate and we've discussed them and now we have a process in which we're going to connect with the different school garden groups. 
Um, I'm not saying this is the same for every district. St. Paul is large, and so we're gonna have to take it that way. Um, one thing that we're going to do when we work with the school garden teams is kind of assess for their assets and their risks, ask them to think about, we're going to just work through the number of their, um, what they want to do and what they probably should do or could do. Um, and then maybe even cut that in half again, because <laughs> it is very, very easy to say, I want, I want to feed people, but then it's very hard. You have to manage that space. That's the only thing, like a garden is great, but it needs, it needs people. And then we get the garden plan for COVID. I'm really thinking that's about, about a page where we're kind of one, identifying the capacity, the resources, and we're talking about how we're communicating. This will make my facilities or grounds department very happy when everything is said and done. And it also will give them a document that they can share with anybody that's reaching out to them. It's also something they can go back and share with their lead engineer and their principal so that they're both comfortable with what's gonna happen on school property. Next slide, please. So garden communication. Um, these are just some of the ideas that um, Sometimes it helps. So if you have ideas for how to kind of connect people, please share that in the chat now. Um, and in fact, if you have other ideas of how to plant in a garden for success, please share that in the chat as well. We are all learning together and together we're gonna have the best ideas. Um, really what comes out of all of this communication, communication piece is not me telling anybody what to do, but it's how do we make decisions together. And so as much as you can have your communication strategies say, this is what we know, this is how we're gonna work together to try and address the concerns so that everybody can be safe in this garden and we can enjoy it together. That's what your goal is. So whether it's group emails, conference calls, video calls, uh, think about having a shared Google document. Um, it, it could be something that you could share then with another school garden or community garden so that they can see sharing and sharing is so important in this day a sign of genius that might be one of the strategies i don't know if anybody's familiar with that if you're not uh we can discuss that after this towards the end of this workshop um but it's a great way what it does is it reminds people that they're up for a, a slot or, or a job and so what we've done in the past with the number of school gardens is set this up for a weekly maintenance and one household is assigned to water and weed a garden. It could be if you're gonna share beds, like if someone's gonna, if you're gonna let a household take over a bed, that maybe you still have watering assigned to one household and not sharing that watering. Maybe it's having a water barrel out in the school garden so that people can do spot watering as they need to. And then phone trees I mentioned, remember these, I had to say that. <laughs> Come on, teachers. All right. And then on site signage. Yes, I'd say get that signage out there. Uh, make it fun, make it snappy, make it colorful so it gets people's attention and move it around because <laughs> we're going to stop seeing it after a little while. But we need to remember it. All right. Oh, I think I skipped ahead a little bit. So, yes, school garden planting strategies use it or lose it, as we say in the gardening world. You got to plant your garden. Cover crops, low maintenance. One option is adopt a bed, um, and then or partner with an organization. You might be surprised that there would be somebody or an organization that has a few people that are looking for something to do. This might be the thing for them, um, and that they could. You have to figure it out though. If you're doing it at a school district, what kind of agreement is needed? It could vary from district to district. So double check with your folks. Double check with your administration. Thank you. Next slide. Or we can keep talking. No. <laughs> Thank you. Here's Heidi. Um, just a couple things to follow up. Some things we were talking about school gardens versus community gardens. Uh, some things to consider, like Kirsten mentioned, we don't have students now. I know a lot of our planting is done right now in the spring before the end of school. It's our fun end of the school year thing. Um, but not having students now and possibly not in the fall, just thinking, do you want to plant? Um, are there things you can plant, like she mentioned, low maintenance? Uh, what are some other options? I know I'm checking out beds to families 
um, partly because we have a large garden and I've been wanting to do that anyway, but it provides a good opportunity for that. Also, where is the harvest going to go? If you're doing individual plots, then the families can just keep that. But if you're still considering on doing your regular garden as usual, um, it might be a concern to some people, even though it's not foodborne, um, saying, you know, maybe some people don't want the harvest, but also not having people there to help you, where would you take that? So a question might be, um, you have all this great stuff, where do you want to take it? Um, so you could donate that to the food shelf too. Um, who can you recruit to help you continue to garden? That would be families and possible partnerships. Um, I, I know some, in a normal summer, some YMCA's have day camps or some different groups have different camps that might be available to help out. You might still be able to get some of that if you have not that many people at a time to go in there necessarily. So some other alternatives to, um, to just a general, your regular run in the middle school garden program, which would be having students there, would be having family or school staff check out beds or areas, uh, doing a cover crop such as red clover and lower maintenance plantings, which we talked about, smaller groups for summer programs. It would still, I'm still floating the idea of having maybe three or four, you know, groups and having them in the same family because we have a school with say you have three or four kids in the same family and saying okay I will do a program with different kids at different times um, and for the produce donating a food shelf maybe families would be wanting to pick up some of the produce that you have and you could have pickup times for that and also freeze it for future use so um, like beans and things if you have the ability to blanch vegetables or if you have berries and different things that you can freeze for when school is back to normal kind of. <laughs> so those are some of the different considerations for specifically school gardens. Thank you, Heidi. Um, this is Grace again, and I just wanted to share uh, more resources with you. Um, the two at the top we already talked about briefly, but another reminder, uh, MDA created this fantastic fact sheet. Again, we'll share the links with you um, in the chat and in a follow-up email. Um, and Extension created a guide and an FAQ um, that you might find helpful. Um, also, the National Farm to School Network created a resource page uh, specifically around COVID-19. And if you visit that resource page, there is a garden-specific section with um, resources on it that might be of interest to you. Um, so that's one place where nationally we're pulling together some information um, some additional school garden resources here. Uh, the School Garden Support Organization Forum, um, the website for the Minnesota Schoolyard Garden Coalition. Um, and keep in mind there are other resources always coming up. Um, this one was recently shared to us with a, a coordinator of our Farm to School Leadership Team that there is funding available for elementary school gardens in Minnesota. Um, and there's a little link there, uh, but there are definitely other things like that um, always popping up. Um, otherwise... Hey Grace, um, somebody asked if the recording will be made available. It will, yes. Well, you'll get a link afterwards, and we'll also make it publicly available, post it on the Renewing Countryside website, um, and a couple of our partner organizations have said they're interested too. Good question. Yeah, so share it with your colleagues. Um, so this is a good time for those questions if you've been holding on to them or thinking through them. Feel free to put them in the chat or feel free to um, unmute yourself. This can be conversational. Um, and we've got uh, the panelist experts with us. We've got folks from MDA and MDE and we have each other. Uh, everyone here is an expert. Um, we're excited to hear what you've done, so time for questions. Are there any questions coming up in the chat uh, that someone, anyone would wanna read off or no? 
Yeah, so Annalise, so this is probably a question for you. If you have a communal water source for a community garden, would you suggest that someone goes out on a daily basis and cleans the faucets and hose handles? Yeah, definitely. During, during use, I mean, I want to specify if, it's, if no one's in the garden that day, it wouldn't make sense. So I think a, a good policy to have would be on the days that it's in use, it is, we, we are sanitizing the, whatever those high touch, if it's the handle for the sprayer, if it's the spigot to turn it on, yep, it would be a good idea to do those. And if you're using wipes, dis there's a number of disinfectant wipes, those are just, those are perfectly acceptable as well. The other thing that I didn't really get to mention there, but it would be a great idea to record that, to have just a real simple log sheet on a clipboard and somebody is just taking note of those steps that you're doing. Did you check the supplies in the hand washing stand? Did you wipe down surfaces? Um, kind of whatever your protocols are that you've developed and you can kind of see those in the plan that Natalie and I and others developed or in other resources. Um, to have some records of that would be a really good idea. It would probably, I bet school administrators would like to see that. And also just um, to reduce the, the questions amongst each other. Hey, did, did you remember to do X, Y, Z? Well, you can just all refer to this document somehow. Or if, it, if that's a virtual document, that would be okay. Um, and Kirsten is asking if tools are left unused for three days. So yeah, I mean, so in food safety and in, in cooking food safety, we often talk about both time and temperature as controls for food safety. So here you're basically using time. The virus likely would be inactivated after that much time, unless you had a monstrous initial load, like an infected person spit all over it. I, I can't imagine that happening, but if that was to be the case, it's possible that after those three days, it wouldn't um, become inactive. So you, you could set them aside. The other thing to remember though, is that other foodborne illnesses can continue to grow. Other bacteria, other soil borne stuff might be on those tools. Sitting it there, bacteria grow in the environment. They proliferate, viruses don't. They're actually not even alive. So the virus might inactivate, but other bacteria might proliferate. And the last thing to consider is it's going to be maybe a lot to keep track of. Are you going to remember if that one's been cleaned or not or how long it's been sitting there? There's probably a lot of people coming and going. It probably would be a more foolproof strategy to say after use every time we wipe it down, after every time it's cleaned. Then it's tucked away and it's there and you kind of know it's ready as opposed to like how long has it been there? Those are just some thoughts. Other people might have other ideas too. I would also add um, one thing that we really stressed in this template is that you should be identifying who's going to be in charge of making sure that your sanitizers are stocked um, and that paper towels and soap and water and all of that stuff is stocked. Um, so like if it's a, if it's a rule that someone's going to go out every day and wipe down the high touch surfaces, like who's making sure that you have enough supplies um, in stock to do that. I have a quick follow-up question with regard to uh, uh, in Cambridge. Our garden is it's plot holders. There's probably 60 plot holders. They come very small numbers throughout the day. Uh, it seems like cleaning something at a particular time wouldn't be very effective. Our strategy is signage that tells people every time you're done, you rinse off the spigot, you rinse off your tools, you put them away that way. And before you use a tool, you rinse it off or before you touch anything. Because we can't guarantee it's going to be sanitized before the next person gets there. It's for that person to essentially do it every time. Is that okay? John, when you say rinse off, do you mean with water or are you spraying with a disinfectant solution? We have spray soap bottles at every water spigot. Yep. And, uh, and the handle that they have to turn it on is there. So they walk back with the wand. They can spray with the soap and then they can rinse off afterwards and put their hands to it. I guess we I would don't just... Have, we don't have trash barrels and we haven't had people take home trash. So I don't know if we'd have to bring in and have trash and have it removed. That creates a problem for volunteers. Right. Um. 
so in that situation, I agree. It, it since people are coming and going at unknown times, it, you probably wouldn't say every day at ten o'clock. You know, that wouldn't make sense. It would be after use. But the only thing in your situation is that you didn't have a disinfecting step. You were just washing it with soap and water, which is definitely better than nothing. But that's going to inactivate some of the virus, but an actual disinfectant with a bleach or there's other non-bleach alternatives that I didn't call it out, but that EPA does have a list of 370 disinfectants that are approved for use against this virus. So if one of them um, could be used in addition to that cleaning step, that would be best. And it can definitely be a wipe. There is more, more waste with that. And there was a question that while I'm here, I'll just talk about the idea of some schools not wanting to use bleach, which is um, totally acceptable. And there are a number of other options. There's peroxyacetic acid based um, ones that, that are in many different formulations. So that EPA, list is pretty easy and you might might be working with your city or your school's um, resources there, whoever the grounds, and you can figure out what chemicals they're using already, what chemicals the kitchen is using or other city offices, and then double check that that is on that list and then just go ahead and use that. Um, Renee in the chat had a question from a school garden support organization call about 7% alcohol being mentioned versus a bleach solution due to bleach being impacted by sunlight, temps and length of time the solution has been sitting. I imagine there's some information in that EPA list, but um, does anyone have any comments about the alcohol solution? So that, I mean, 7% alcohol doesn't give us enough really to go on like so is that a 7% like uh, isopropyl alcohol is almost always much higher, like a, a you know, 70% when you buy it at the store. Anyways, it needs to be labeled for food contact surfaces. Um, and sometimes people think that you can just maybe go and buy some alcohol at the at Walgreens or something and put it into some water. But it, there are specific disinfectants that are labeled for this and a number of them are, are not bleach. And if you want to move away from bleach, for the fumes or everything, just find an, a non-bleach alternative. And bleach does degrade after some time, but in a bot, in a small, in a quart size bottle, it's fine. It's going to be in there for a week, maybe two weeks. It's fine. I wouldn't let it sit all summer. Yeah, I, I would definitely replace it after that. Um, but it's just going to be fairly stable in that container because you've got the cap on and everything. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, are there things that you heard about today that you have found works for your garden or clarifying questions that might give us some further examples? Feel free to chat it or unmute yourself. I have a question for the group. One thing that we hear questions about at farmers markets and at farms is glove use. So sometimes are, are people thinking or hearing from their schools that they believe that gloves will be required? Is that a concern at all? Um, I'll speak for my work with St. Paul Public Schools. I would say it's not going to be required. Um, it might be a recommendation that the garden team shares amongst the people who will be participating in the garden um, with the thought that you're not as likely to touch your face if you're wearing those dirty gloves. And it's just primarily just to kind of, again, that transmission of touching something and then touching your face and your mouth. Anyone else on gloves or otherwise? 
I guess I should just be clear that so Natalie and I in the FAQ that we created along with the um, template, there is a nice summary of gloves too. But just to be clear, they, they really aren't required for food safety. If they might be required by your administration or your city, then I guess that's the policy. But you can be clear that we wash our hands well and therefore that's those are the steps we take for hand hygiene. If you do wear gloves, just make sure to wash your hands well and they don't replace hand washing. You still need to replace them pretty frequently. So anytime that they get torn or tattered or you have a reason to think that they're contaminated. So you end up kind of going through some gloves and gloves can be hard to come by. So I just wanted to be really clear that people don't think, oh my goodness, we can't have a safe garden because we don't have gloves because that would not be true. So you can supply them if you want, but hand washing and hand washing that's actually used um, is completely adequate. Thank you. Um, there's still time. I know we're at the hour, but we also have an extra half hour. Um, so there's still time if you're able to stay with us. Um, if you have any questions or examples about what's worked or come up um, as useful tools or practices in your school or community garden. This might also be a time um, if uh, Sammy with MDE or Valerie with MDA have anything that they feel is relevant to share um, with this audience uh, about uh, school gardens or communal gardening right now. I know I shared some resources um, and we'll certainly share that in the link in the follow-up, but um, feel free to hop in here. Um, Sammy or Valerie, if there's anything you want to share. I think you guys did a great job. So not at this time, unless a question comes up. Thanks, Grace. Yeah, I would definitely agree. I thought this has been a great presentation. I think um, I, I was just watching the chat and I a comment about you know being hopeful to have a chance to do this safely i think yes definitely I, that's something that we're, we're trying to emphasize and you know i think there are ways that we can do a lot with a lot of different gardening that that can still be safe this summer so just following some of these these really um well thought out guidance driver well thought out practices so yeah thank you thank you both um, I did see something come up in the chat uh, as well about some examples um, around Minnesota egg in the classroom and that was a resource I meant to share and we can share in our follow up. Um, there's some opportunities ahead around that, including um, uh, school gardens. Uh, and if Sue is still on, I know she was on earlier, she's welcome to chime in too. She manages that project. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other questions, we want to say thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy day today. Um, we know it's a really strange time and everyone's juggling a lot. So the fact that you took some time today means a lot to us. Um, we have contact information here. If you'd like to get in touch with any of our presenters, um, you may do so, of course. Uh, and um, I'd like to thank everyone who joined us sharing their expertise, this list of people. Um, we really appreciate the time you took to share the information that you have. Um, again, we'll be following up uh, with the uh, links and details where you can um, click through and find these resources. And from Renewing the Countryside, we um, really appreciate you all um, participating in this. Uh, and sharing your insight. Any final comments or questions? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you.